Hi everyone, this is a lecture on value and the concept of contrast. And contrast is driven by that value. So please start a new set of notes in your sketchbook, title it value and contrast or just value. Okay, now when we talk about value in art and design, we don't necessarily mean the cost of it or the significance of something, not always. So here, when we talk about value, we are gonna refer to the lightness or darkness of something. The value of objects in a work of art is all relative to its surroundings. Here's an example to help you understand value and its impact on contrast. And here are our friends, A and B. They are back to help us out. So notice in A, the gray square seems pretty stable, unmoving, it's imposing, you can tell that it's there, it's an interruption to the space. But that same gray square in B has less visual weight and it seems more luminous than physical because it's surrounded by a black background. Now I want you to notice that these, or please please believe me, <laughs> these two squares, the gray squares, are the same color gray. The one in A is not darker than the one in B and vice versa. They are the same color gray. And to accentuate this concept, I want you to notice the value scale to the right of the screen. Value and and contrast are all about context. It all depends on what is nearby. So the scale on the right of the screen, the areas near the top and the bottom are more visibly eye-catching. The bottom part, on the bottom part of that scale, you can see that the middle bar, that gray bar, it looks like it's getting darker toward the bottom. But the cool part about this is that the bar in the middle is gray. It doesn't change colors. It's all the same gray. It is not darker or lighter at any point. It's an illusion. So um, to prove it, you can pause this video and cover up the sides of the, um, the value scale. You can cover up the faded gradient part. And when you do that, you'll notice that the middle bar is the same color gray all the way throughout. Kind of, It kind of blows your mind, I would say. Feel free to pause this if you need to. An artist who explores these concepts about color contrast and contrast is called Joseph Albers or Josef Albers. He's a hero to a lot of painters and, and uh, designers. And he's a hero because he already equipped us with the answers to explorations on color and illusions. And we'll talk about that more in, in a different lecture, in the color lecture, but this is really where it all starts. And so maybe you wonder, have you seen these illusions in real life? Yes, yes, you have. I'm sure a lot of you have used the dark mode on your phones or your computers. If you're using Microsoft Office, the updated versions, you'll probably notice that everything is automatically in dark mode. So that's very interesting. I don't know, it kind of messes me up sometimes. But anyhow, the settings that turn your backgrounds black and the text white is a good example of how communication and expression are affected by contrast and value. And so I want you to write this down. Communication and expression are affected by the contrast, the, the concept of contrast, and contrast is characterized by the visual amount of difference in value. So contrast, again, is the visual differences in value. High contrast items seem to be more clear and there's improved readability, and you can detect that in the two rightmost sections of this example on the slide. Artists and designers often use lower contrast, um, value contrast for shapes of secondary importance or for subtle messages. So when you're trying to make something that's very important, as like a graphic designer will say, you'll use a really, really dark background and a really, really, really bright foreground or text or something. Another medium where the concept of contrast is used all the time is photography. Photographers are especially aware of the importance of contrast, and if you've ever used filters to photograph things like on social media or something, you know how a quick filter change can drastically change the mood of an image. And so here's an example. The left photo is called Powerhouse Mechanic by photographer Lewis Hine. In this photograph, you can detect the location of the light source, which is kind of um, top right-ish, kind of behind, well, definitely behind the camera out of the picture frame. And the definition of the musculature and the machinery, both of those are very clear and readable to the eye. So in as far as mood is concerned, this image appears to be gritty, 
it exudes strength, it highlights strength and form of the subject. The image on the right, though, is a little bit different. It's called The Terminal by Alfred Stieglitz, who's a very prominent photographer. This image on the right, this photograph on the right, is significantly darker compared to the one on the left, Heinz's. And the low contrast of this photograph invites the viewer here into more of a pre-industrial world of horses and carriages as opposed to machinery, and it's more atmospheric, I would say. It's more atmospheric than punchy. You can almost hear the, um, the backgrounds of both of these photographs. I can hear the clanging and the steam of machinery in the left one, and then maybe the whinny of horses and conversation in the right. These two works of art are composed with only black and white, and you've probably already guessed and understand that powerful meaning can be achieved with limited materials like this, black and white. The drawing on the left is about 80% dark value, and the print on the right is about 80% light value. So you can say that these two works of art have different value distributions. Most of the distribution of the white, uh, of the drawing on the right is lighter value, and most of it on the left is dark value. And artists and designers distribute value in different ways to create a sense of mystery or tension, etc. And so in the left example, there's definite mystery there. Mystery is created by the hierarchy that draws your eye to the crime scene in the back. It's kind of in the center. You can tell someone has been hurt there or maybe murdered. And as you're looking at it, your eye automatically comes forward again to the man who is drinking coffee. And don't you want to know who this guy is? Do you wonder maybe what his relationship is to the crime scene? What happened? Did he murder the guy? Is this the guy who was murdered, etc.? So there's a lot of mystery created uh, with the use of dark value. Lighter values, though, suggest more mm, optimism, openness, obviously the sense of light, clarity, and that is embodied in Kevin Fletcher's print, which is the image on the right. This one leads your eye from a dark foreground to a brightly lit background, and you can definitely detect where the light source is in this particular composition. So instead of feeling trapped, we are, as viewers, we are liberated by the suggested journey illuminated before us. Now, I know this can seem a little obvious to some of you, but the visual expression of volume is also achieved through tactful use of value. Shapes in this painting transform into volumes that appear to extend out from the surface of this painting. So remember, we talked about the difference between shape and form. Shape is more two-dimensional. Form is technically here since we're in 2D design. It's technically still two-dimensional, but the illusion of three-dimensionality is what it gives, it changes from a shape to a form. So these statues are painted on a flat surface, right? They're 2D, literally 2D, but they give the illusion of 3D, and that is achieved through contrast. And so a little bit of background on this. This painting is actually just a section of a painting, and it's by Jan van Eyck. And he's like the father, I guess, of oil painting. And he utilized this method called grisaille. I'm sorry, I can't say it. It's French. Grisaille. I think it's French. Anyway, um, and basically what that means is artists would start with a black and white painting um, full of value contrast, and then they would lay transparent layers of color on top of it. So here, the two middle images were, are left just in their gray states. And to me, to my eye, they're more powerful embodiments of three-dimensionality than their colored in subjects to the left and the right. That's just my opinion, but I think that the two um, central forms are more 3D in appearance. But that's all achieved through value contrast. And so let's talk a little bit about more contemporary stuff. The game of value that is used to create the illusion of form and even space. So um, I will tell you a little bit more about space in a different lecture, but you guys understand that space is like the background. It's the area. It's not a form. It's not an object. It's like the context, right? It's the room that's around your objects. But anyway, the illusion of form uh, and space that's achieved by value contrast is often used in film and in set design. So here's an example of an experiment done by Hebert Zadel, and he experiments with the outcomes of a subject and mood when different lights are placed 
in different orientations. So we're going to look at these images from left to right. In the leftmost image, uh, a key light is placed at a 45 degree angle. And you can tell it's at like the off of her left shoulder. It's shining onto her, right? You can see that. Um, if you add a backlight in image two, so adding a light behind the subject further separates the actor from the background and adds more definition. You can see that on her shoulders. So see in the fur in the leftmost image, you can't really tell where her shoulders and are separated from the background, but adding a light behind her definitely shows us where her shoulders are. Um, let's see, number three, the third image is has an addition of something called a fill light. Now, the fill light is not as strong or as bright as the key light. Just keep that in mind. It's more diffused and it's softer, but you can tell that by adding that fill light off of her other shoulder, off of her left shoulder, um, it decreases the intensity of darkness, both in the background and in the shadows. So you can tell by her jawline is more defined and then the background is less dark. And what this really does to a subject in film is it makes them more approachable, less formidable. So she appears subconsciously, I guess, to be a little bit more friendly. Now, the last image, the one on the far right, is completely different. So here, what we've done is we've taken three lights, all of the same brightness, and one of them's in the back, like normal, and then two of them are on the sides, directly 90 degrees to the subject they're facing each other and what this one does it really increases the drama i'm sure you can tell that it makes it very dramatic but it also enhances the form's volumetric characteristics so often if you ever go to a museum that's like um only about that only features sculpture and they're not enclosed in like the glass cases a lot of times what you'll see is if um you go into these museums like i think the museum uh the sculpture museum in dallas does this but they'll place windows or lights on the sides of course and what that does is gives a really strong sense of modeling or three-dimensionality because it uses light from the sides to em emphasize the forms so it creates really strong shadows lots of drama and of course we're going to look at a black and white film to explore this example a little bit further these two images are scenes from a film from 1942 called Casablanca, and it was directed by Michael Curtiz. It's a really good movie. You should watch it if you have time. I know um, watching black and white films is kind of hard these days because it's not as striking and not as fun, but it's a good way to get in touch with our American history, if you will. But um, only do it if you have time. Don't go out of your way, you know. <laughs> Um, anyway, so the lighting is fairly dark when we first enter the cafe where most of the action will occur in the movie. I'm going to try my best not to do any spoilers, but um, the image on the left is a scene from the beginning of the movie. This is the scene in the cafe, and uh, let's see, how can I describe it? Well, there's a lot of mystery and tension in this film. Um, there's high emotions, romance, it, potentially a murder, these things, and it's kind of foreshadowed by this simple laying out of value, the distribution of value at the beginning. So um, in the left image, you can see the piano player, Sam, my favorite. Um, and then you can see the audience members that are closest to the stage. They're all there. It's a dark background, but these people are brightly lit and it kind of um, symbolizes the optimistic song that Sam is singing. And then in the image on the right, these are the two villains that are in the movie, and they are very often seen as lit by the side. Very strong side lighting happens whenever they're in the scene. And remember from our previous example, those experiments, lighting from the sides of the subject really um, increases their three-dimensionality, three but it also increases drama too. So of course, the two villains would be dramatized by side lights. And this is still something that's done today. These particular images are an artist's digital value studies on the movie La La Land. So you can see, you can probably recognize some of the actors in these. It's a fun way to relax and practice. Um, if you want to watch a movie or something and you're trying to get better at value and illusion and get better at seeing, I know that sounds silly, but getting better at seeing is very important to artists and designers. So feel free to do a value study in your sketchbook. 
Um, what I do is I use only three values, white, medium, gray, and black. And it's best to keep these studies small so that you don't get bogged down with perfection, but they can often help you appreciate the design work that goes into movies. Don't worry about turning this in for a grade. It's optional. It's just something that you can do if you have time.